So welcome everyone to the Penn State College of Medicine, Understanding Primary Immunodeficiency, a Project ECHO Clinical Education Series. We're very glad to see you all this afternoon. My name is Melissa and I'm an Education Specialist with the Project ECHO team. I'll be sitting in for your regular facilitator, Jackie Sable today. She is off today, but she will be back with you at your next session. Before I begin our regular announcements, I'm going to ask uh, my partner, if she would please introduce herself, my ECHO partner, Caitlin. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin. I'm an education program coordinator with the Project ECHO team. I'll be helping out today with attendance and some behind the scenes data collection. Thank you so much. Before I begin with the regular announcements, I'm going to ask our participants if they would please put your full name, your role and your workplace into the chat. Since we have so many people joining us, we'll use the chat for our introductions. We do ask that you stay muted unless you're speaking. You may always use the chat to communicate if you're not able to unmute, such as being in clinic, but please try to be aware of not allowing the chat to explode so our panelists can keep up. There's a lot of vital information in this series and we do not want to miss anything. We do ask that if you're able, and again, you may not be, but if you're able, please turn your video on for the entire session. It helps us to put names and faces together. Please have the case called up on your screen if you would like to see the case details during our collaborative discussion. I will share my screen while our participant presents the case details, but then I'll stop sharing so that we can have our group discussion. Please do remember that no personally identifiable information is allowed when discussing cases and patients. We are recording these sessions for our team's quality improvement purposes, and we do share all materials with you after the session. Most captioning is enabled if you would like to use it, just click on the CC icon on your Zoom screen. And finally, in the spirit of ECHO's all teach, all learn education model, we will all be on a first name only basis during our sessions. But most importantly, what this means is that we all learn from one another, panelists and participants alike. Our flash talk today will be on antibody deficiencies and that is going to be presented by Dr. Paula Hanau. Following Dr. Hanau's presentation, Dr. Judith Cohen will present our case details and then we'll begin our group discussion. I will help to facilitate this session. Um, Paula will also be giving a summary of case recommendations at the end of our discussion. So I'm gonna ask our hub team to also help respond to questions in the chat and we'll try to be sure we have time for that summary. Now let's move on to our panelists and I'm gonna ask them to unmute and briefly introduce themselves. Let's start with Ken. Hi, my name is Ken. I'm a patient with PI. I also am a leader of a support group with IDF here in Texas. Great to have you. Thanks for joining. Colleen? Hello, everybody. I am Colleen Brock. I am the manager of medical programs for IDF. I uh, also have a PI, as do two of our young adult children, and I am a registered nurse. Thanks, Colleen. And Megan. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Messick, and I'm the Director of Education at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and I'm so happy to be here with you all this afternoon. Thanks very much. Paula. Hi, how are you, everybody? I'm uh, Paula Now. I'm a physician uh, in allergy, asthma, and immunology at Penn State Hershey Medical Center. Thanks very much. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And Melissa, sorry, yeah. Diana is on. So can we introduce her? Sorry, Diana. Hi, my name is Diana, and I am the mother of a child with PI. Great. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for catching that, Colleen. All right, let me share my screen and Paula, whenever you are ready, let's go through our introductory slides here. All right, over to you. So very excited to talk to you all today. Um, feel free to interrupt me throughout the presentation. Um, with any questions. And today we're going to talk specifically about antibody deficiencies. We really have been talking about antibody deficiencies a lot um, with our cases. Um, and this will really hopefully seal the deal in terms of how do we do lab analysis and what other considerations we think about in terms of antibody deficiency. So my hope is that by the end of this talk, next slide, 
will really have a framework uh, for understanding antibody deficiencies or deficiencies of the humoral immune, uh, immune system. Um, we'll have an understanding of general laboratory evaluation for recurrent sinopulmonary infections. And I'll discuss some examples of antibody deficiency. Some of them we've already discussed, so I'll really focus more on lab analysis and other things of that nature in terms of what we can think about in these cases. So next slide. So I think the reason that these keep on popping up in our cases is quite obvious because antibody deficiency is by far the most common primary immunodeficiency. Um, and you can see that this in this pie, there is a large portion at both globally and in the US, almost half of primary immunodeficiencies are truly antibody deficiencies. So the big pie in blue, um, that big slice is primary um, antibody deficiencies. All right, next slide. And the typical presentation we really have been talking about a lot, um, so I won't go too in depth here, but sinopulmonary infections are really the crux. Um, that's when we start thinking about it. So people have mentioned urinary tract infections and other infections, but really we're seeing the most or the bulk of antibody deficiencies or deficiencies of the humoral immune system in terms of sinopulmonary infections. We can also see other infections, so enteric infections, especially um, with regards to enteric viruses, um, can occur, um, and cellulitis, osteomyelitis, meningitis. In terms of organisms, the vast majority of solely humoral immunodeficiencies, so solely immunodeficiencies of um, antibodies, really don't include a lot of opportunistic infections. There are common infections that a lot of people get. So things like strep pneumo, H. influenza, meningococcus, staph aureus, camp, uh, pseudomonas, Campylobacter, salmonella, mycoplasm, things that we tend to see normal people get, but these people are getting it more frequently, uh, more commonly, and more severe. And we do see some parasitic infections, um, namely Giardia, associated with both common variable immunodeficiency and IgA deficiency. And as Alex Horowitz explained in one of her earlier lectures, just kind of bringing it back, you know, antibodies actually do help us with covering viral infections as well, even though that's not their ma the majority of their role. Once the viruses are intracellular, antibodies can't do a whole lot, but once they're extracellular, antibodies can help, and so enteroviral infections, so diarrhea associated with enteroviral infections can occur as well. Next slide. So I want to really start basic today and think a little bit about what is in a CBC? And this will all make sense, hopefully, once I start putting things together. So when I start looking, a lot of my learners, um, you know, they look at a CBC, and especially if you're in the inpatient setting, and you just see a white count, red blood cells, and platelets. And I really try to encourage my learners to go a little bit beyond that and just look at what's specifically in the white count. So the eosinophils, the neutrophils, and importantly for primary immunodeficiency, the lymphocytes. So we can see what is abnormal in this CBC. Well, the white count is totally normal and you might get CBCs with differentials in your practice all the time. And I encourage you to always look at, hey, what is the, what is the neutrophil count? What is the lymphocyte count? Because that can give you a little bit of glimmer into what else could be wrong. So in this patient, normal white count, this is a health, like a patient not in a, in distress, not in sepsis, um, but the lymphocyte count is quite low. That's, um, that's 0 0.20 represents a lymphocyte count of 200. So that is, that is already concerning in, in and of itself. All right, next slide. So when we think about that patient with that lymphocyte count of 200, what is a lymphocyte count really telling us? And in a broad sense, it, it's a little bit more nuanced than this, um, but in a broad sense, really the lymphocyte count encounters two things. One is B cells and the other is T cells. So I like to think, you know, if I put a patient with HIV and I um, think of CD4 cells, that's one type of lymphocyte. 
So in this particular patient that we looked above, with a total lymphocyte of 200, that is a, the total amount of lymphocytes that the patient has. So I know off the bat that that CD4 count like is definitely going to be lower than 200. And the B cells are probably going to be extremely low as well. Um, something's happening. So when we think in terms of HIV, we think of a trigger 200 is when we are getting concerned. Well, if I see that lymphocyte count of 200, I know my B cells were probably low and my T cells are probably low to make that happen. So what happens in terms of B cells? And we've discussed that some B cells can make antibodies on their own. Um, so those are B1 cells specifically. You don't need to know that in that detail, but some B cells can make antibodies on their own. Other B cells need an activation from a T cell to make more antibodies, and that's called a T cell dependent process. Why that's important is that any time that we have a T cell deficiency, we will automatically have a B cell deficiency as well. In terms of markers, um, the most important markers for B cells are CD19 and CD20. There are others. Um, and that will be become relevant in terms of what we interpret in terms of flow cytometry. B cells um, can also be measured in terms of what is an activated B cell. So CD27 can show us whether a B cell is inactive and whether or whether a B cell is active, which is very important to know, are most of our cells really working or are they just being relaxed? In terms of T cells, we, you know, chuck them in two categories. All T cells are CD3, 20, uh, CD3 positive, but we have two types of T cells mainly. Um, and those are CD4, which are our helper T cells that can activate B cells or our CD8 cells, which help with direct killing. So next slide. So I like to think about an evaluation of the immune system. And this really is a concept that, eval that applies to a lot of concepts in medicine in terms of, do we have the right quantity? And later, do we have the right quality? So in terms of evaluating B cells and quantity, we're thinking, first of all, do we have the right amount of B cells? And typically we can get that through flow cytometry by evaluating, do I have the right amount of CD19 positive cells? So if you look at this, this is what um, flow cytometry um, to evaluate what I would order would be lymphocyte subsets. Um, so I'd get a full CBC and then evaluate and order lymphocyte subsets. And this is what I would get. I never look at percentages, I really look at absolute values. And you can see that my CD3 is showing me an elevated, a, a, low, a low number. Um, that's my total number of T cells. My CD4 is showing me my total number of helper T cells. My CD8 is showing me my cytotoxic T cells. And my CD19 is showing me the absolute number of B cells. Um, and so in this patient with the lymphocyte count of um, 200, we have some T cell deficiency, the T cells are low, and absolutely that B cell number is extremely low. Next slide. So now that I've discussed a little bit about quantity of B cells, I want to also address quality, and this is something that we think about. We don't always order this for assessing, but this is an idea of how we can measure quality quality of B cells. So we see if the B cells are activated. In this flow cytometry, um, um, we can look at in this chart that a normal control, I, I wish I had my pointer um, available to me, but the normal control has CD27 positivity that you could see at the very top. In a patient with primary immunodeficiency affecting the humoral immune system significantly, the B cells that are activated, so this patient does have true B cells, and you can see a big amount of B cells in the bottom, but those B cells are not CD27 positive. And so that corner in the left top corner is essentially empty, meaning that although there are a lot of B cells, and you might have a high B cell number, you actually have 
poor amount of activated B cells. And that will be where our CD27 positivity will show. Next slide. So let's say I have a normal amount of B cell quantity and potentially quality. But now let's check, OK, what do B cells produce? And those B cells are going to produce antibody. And so let's go back to quantity. Do I have the right number of immunoglobulins? Do I have the right number of antibodies? And this is when I check for my immunoglobulin number. That's the most common thing that we can all order. So we'll check an IgG, IgM, IgA. The numbers that are normal may vary a little bit by lab. In our lab, we, check, we think of less than 700 micrograms per deciliter as being a low IgG, an IgM of less than 40, and an IgA of less than 70. All right, next slide. But again, we're, it's not sufficient to have the right quantity of immunoglobulins. The next step is to assess, do we have the right quality? And even if we have the wrong low quantity, it may be okay if the quality is superb. So just saying my IgG is 600, therefore it's low, therefore that's bad, that may not necessarily be true if the quality of that is really strong and good. So the point is, do we have, everybody might have slightly different numbers, but as long as we're able to fight infections and are the, the quality of it is good enough, then that might give us enough to, to fight. Um, and that's where assessing quality of immunoglobulins becomes so, so important. Last week, um, Dr. Sullivan talked a little bit about her style of assessing quality. She discussed checking for tetanus, diphtheria, and the pneumovax. And the way that she expressed it, which is how I like to think about it as well, is that the tetanus is a really, really great response. So almost everybody, I, you have to be really deficient to have a poor tetanus response. So if someone gets the tetanus vaccine, we evaluate it, their, their immune response to the tetanus vaccine, and most people are protective, protected because it's a really solid vaccine. The middle of the range protection would be the diphtheria vaccine, and then the poor vaccine response is the pneumovax 23. Why that is is really important and interesting. So the pneumovax uh, vaccination as opposed to the tetanus vaccine, is a polysaccharide vaccine. As we've talked about in other section, sessions, our immune system um, can make really solid responses to proteins. Um, so in the tetanus vaccine, for instance, there is a, T cells can only really respond to proteins. And we need a protein antigen to help the T cell communicate with the B cell and create really, really robust immune response, meaning that it's helping it to create a lot of antibodies. We really need T cells to help communicate with B cells to create a lot, a lot of antibodies. So in a protein-based vaccine, we get a T cell dependent process, meaning the T cell communicates with the B cell and makes it flourish to create a lot of antibodies. This happens in most of the vaccines that we have available. They're protein-based vaccines. COVID vaccine, for instance, is different in that it's an mRNA-based vaccine. Um, at least some of them are. But they eventually, that messenger RNA goes off and makes protein, and it still creates a T-cell-dependent process, making it a very robust vaccine. The Pneumovax 23 is a polysaccharide vaccine, meaning that they only look, they, they don't use protein, but rather the polysaccharide antigens. And in that way, it really is a vaccine that tests the humoral immune system without the T cell response. So because it's a T cell independent, T cells really can't recognize polysaccharides almost at all, um, then it really 
is a very weak vaccine. That's why it's a really hard challenge to pass that Pneumovax 23. You really do have to have a, a robust immune system to pass it. Next slide. So what are other considerations now that we looked at quality and quantity, other considerations that we have to think about when we're evaluating for humoral immunodeficiency? So things that can affect our drugs. So steroids can cause um, a, sub, a subtle decrease in our immunoglobulins as a whole and even impact our quality of immune um, response. Rituximab, as we discussed earlier, B cells have a CD20 marker. And so rituximab actually is an anti-CD20, meaning it effectively kills B cells. So if someone is on rituximab, we really are wiping off their B cells pretty effectively. So it's normal for them to have a really poor immune response. That's why it's so important to check immunoglobulins before initiation of rituximab, because we really need to know, is this person, if they later have an issue with their immune system, was it present before the initiation of rituximab, or is this something brand new and it's acquired because of the rituximab? And that's a really important question. Multiple myeloma is a very interesting scenario where we can have really high numbers, like a very elevated IgG, but because the IgG is monoclonal, meaning you only have one, then you can you lack all of the diversity. And so that is not an I the strength of immunoglobulins comes in their diversity. So if you only have one type of monoclonal, antibody that's just repeated over and over and over, it's not going to help in the, in the fight against infections. And protein losing enteropathy or someone that has profound diarrhea is going to have a lot of low immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins, like any protein, can be excreted in the stool. So if you have someone with a low albumin and is having a lot of diarrhea for other reasons, either Crohn's disease or um, another reason, it is common to have low immunoglobulins, but their vaccine response should be very um, robust. All right, next slide. So we'll talk a little bit in the time that we have left about common deficiencies of the humoral immune system. The most common immunodeficiency altogether is selective IgA deficiency. So meaning that only your IgA is low. Um, and the vast majority of people are asymptomatic and have no issues with having an, an IgA deficiency. They tend to be diagnosed by chance. So I think a lot of us as primary care providers will check an IgA when we're checking for tissue transglutamidase in the evaluation of celiac disease. And in that way can pick up someone having an IgA deficiency. In the patients that do present because of issues, they tend to have recurrent sinopulmonary infections, but selective antibody deficiency can be associated with other issues, including autoimmunity, certain gastrointestinal infections like GI disorders, like IBD and celiac disease. And um, it can set you up as having common variable immunodeficiency or another primary immunodeficiency in the future. I tend to follow my patients with IgA. There's no hard and stone rule, but um, I do tend to follow my patients with IgA deficiency at least every couple of years to see if they've developed new infections or if their other immunoglobulins have dropped. So it, having a new onset IgA deficiency could be the first start to maybe have developing low IgG or low IgM in the future and could be a setup to developing a common variable immunodeficiency in the future. Not everybody does. So most of the patients, as discussed, will continue to remain asymptomatic for their entire lives without any issues. One commonly tested question when I like teach medical students, and this is just so sad because it's propagated, is that there are common or we should be concerned for anaphylaxis reactions in patients with IgA deficiency. 
actually never seen this happen. Um, and it's so exceedingly rare that we don't really consider it a consideration. Think about it in terms of like my patients with really profound IgA deficiency with common variable immunodeficiency. They're getting immunoglobulin product that has IgA and they all the time and they've don't react. So this is really, really rare. I would not deny someone a transfusion um, just because of a history of IgA deficiency. Next slide. So next, um, we'll talk a little bit about X-linked agammaglobulinemia. And on the uh, right hand uh, is the physician that discovered the pri first primary immunodeficiency. Um, and um, that's um, Dr. Bruton over at Walter Reed. And this um, is due to a mutation in the Bruton tyrosine kinase that results in a profound arrest in B cell development. And essentially what happens here is that you have zero or very close to zero B cells altogether, meaning that because you don't have really any B cells that are reached maturity, then you're not making any antibody. So this is a profound um primary immunodeficiency. There are other types of um, a, genes, so it is not always the Bruton tyrosine kinase. There are other genes that can um, be monogenic and affect a, a similar picture. But this was the first one that was discovered. And this, these patients present with very early age, typically with significant sinopulmonary infections that start around six months of age when maternal um, a antibody start to wane. All right, next slide. I'll talk a little bit about hyper IgM syndrome. So hyper IgM syndrome can come in a couple different varieties. This one specifically, uh, the most common one is specifically due to a defective CD40 ligand on helper T cells. So going way back into like your immunology for many, many, many years ago, there is two sort of connections that need to happen for antibodies to, to get created. So as we talked about, T cells motivate B cells to release antibodies, but they can't do that just by the T cell and the B cell receptor binding to one another. They actually need that second handshake. And that second handshake is that CD40 ligand and CD40 binding together, when those um, interactions occur in the right setting, that'll activate, the T cell will activate the B cell to start creating more antibodies and switching the antibodies. So importantly, that is necessary for the B cell who normally only um, makes IgM and IgD as well, but mainly IgM, to start switching to other types of immunoglobulins, IgG, IgA, and IgE. And so if there's an absence of the CD40 ligand, there is no ability to class switch and for the B cell to um, make germinal centers and have an ability to produce robust antibody production that includes IgG, IgA, and IgE kind of opposite to what the name implies, the vast majority of patients actually have normal IgM or it can be elevated, but importantly, they have low IgG, IgA, and IgE. Um, and interestingly, because T cells need CD40 ligand for their own um, management, this also, this is a humoral immunodeficiency that's also accompanied by poor um, T cell response. So the, you do have um, opportunistic infections that can happen or that tend to happen with this type of uh, humoral immune no deficiency. So you can have pneumocystis, uh, crispusporidium, or CMV due to interact those interactions being important for cellular T cell immunity as well. Next slide. Common variable immunodeficiency, we have talked um, a little bit about, or maybe a, maybe a lot about. Um, and, and this one is a very interesting one because it really is a wastebasket term for a lot of immunodeficiencies that we don't have monogenic causes for. 
Um, so very small percentage, anywhere from five to 10% of common variable immunodeficiencies are truly monogenic, meaning there's only one gene that is the cause. And typically when we find the monogenic cause, um, most in most cases, we no longer call it common variable immunodeficiency. We switch and call it, it's this gene that, that caused it. So I will, I will, if if someone is ICOS is a great example, I will call it ICOS immunodeficiency slash common variable immunodeficiency. So once I find the gene, I might change the way I describe it a little bit because it changes the, a little bit in terms of management and the thought process behind it. So the vast majority don't have a monogenic cause. They might have multiple genes that led to the issue and, and environmental causes. It's, it's really poorly understood. And it really, so it, because it's so many genes, it really is extraordinarily heterogeneous in terms of how it presents. Um, a very, very broad spectrum of severity and presentation. In the US, most immunologists define common variable immunodeficiency by having a low IgG and either a low IgM or a low IgA. You can't have both. You have to have one other one that is low other than the IgG and having a poor vaccine response um, to either T cell dependent or T cell independent vaccines. So our T cell dependent vaccine would probably be tetanus of diphtheria. Our T cell independent vaccine, which is the one that most people have difficulty mounting a, an immune response would be pneuma, pneumovax. For qualifying for poor vaccine response um, in terms of uh, pneumococcal, that's a little bit um, a challenging thing concept, but essentially you need to count the number. So of, of um, number of serotypes in the pneumococcal that are low. So the, the trigger is 1.3. So you want to have, for to qualify for the condition, you need to have less than 1.3 in more, in at least 70 of the serotypes tested. So if you test for 23 serotypes, you want to have less than, or you don't want that, but you have to have less than 1.3 um, micrograms per milliliter in at least 70% um, of the, sorry, in at least 30% of the serotypes tested meaning you for having good serotype protection, you need to have greater than 1.3 micrograms per milliliter in at least 70 of the serotypes tested. So you'd count, if you have 23, you count how many have greater than 1.3, and that would give you um, the percentage so over 23, um, how many did you have? Is that is that greater than 70%? If it is, then it's protective. Or a two-fold rise in antibody concentration in that percentage as well. So that one's a little bit tricky in terms of interpreting um, lab interpretation. The other ones are more straightforward. And um, so, and you do need to be able to exclude other causes of hypogammaglobulinemia. So is it is it just the rituximab that was the issue that wouldn't really qualify as common variable immunodeficiency? Is it just protein leucine enteropathy? Is this um, a um, monoclonal gammopathy like MGUS that's causing poor vaccine response? That sort of thing. All right, next slide. So in summary, um, we kind of discussed a lot in terms of laboratory findings that we really need to explore quantity and quality of B cells and antibodies to really assess if our humoral immune response is, is appropriate. Genetics play an important role and that's growing, um, but can be very complicated issue in the setting of different conditions that don't have a clear monogenic cause and particularly creates a little bit of an ethical issue um, in terms of difficulty to interpret um, in patients where we have a lot of undetermined, unclear 
genetics. So a lot of genes that may be unclear whether they're really truly contributing to the disease. The typical presentation for these conditions is, as we've discussed, um, recurrent sinopulmonary infections, but they can vary in severity depending on their condition. All right. And that's going to be it. Next slide is my references. We are. Thank you so much. And thank you for that wonderful presentation, Paula. Everybody will have access to that. Thank you, Judith, for the case today. And thank you all for participating. I do want to ask you to please fill out your session evaluation and be sure to attend our next session on May 8th when we will talk about treatment options for the PI community. Extremely important. Thank you all so very much. Thank you so much.